whenever anybody starts talking about money, most people's eyes glaze over because, of, oh my God, that subject, it's somebody else's field. And I just want to get a sense in the audience here today, how many people actually studied economics at college? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> I have some major reprogramming to do, okay. <laughs> but thank you for your honesty. So um, what we're looking at today is the link between money and sustain the link between money and sustainability. And most people say, well, we just need more money to do the things we want to do. And actually it goes a lot deeper than that. We don't understand money because we are like fish that swim in water. And if you ask a fish to describe water, it can't because it's never been able to, to jump out and get another perspective. So at the end of our conversation here this afternoon, you will become like flying fishes. You will understand money, the whole gestalt of money, what money really does and how it affects sustainability, hopefully at the end of this next uh, 60 minutes together. So in economics textbooks, they tell you what it does. They don't tell you what money is and money lives in the space of an agreement. So I'm going to ask for the first question to this audience in order to get this ticket to go to the Bateman Center is who creates money? So by a show of hands, how many people believe it's the government that creates money? Okay, no, don't feel free, go on. Pardon me, in Canada, in, in Canada, in Canada. Here in Canada, does the government create money? Yes. How many, hands up? Okay. How many believe it's the Central Bank of Canada? Okay. And how many people believe it's the local private bank? Okay, they win the prize. Yeah, it is not your government or central banks. It's actually a private cartel of banks that actually create money. And money is created when you go in and you get a loan for a house or for a motorbike, whatever you want. And why bank debt money, which is fiat, meaning that it's created out of nothing, is so completely unsustainable is because of interest. Interest is something that creates hyper-competition among its users. It programs short-term thinking. It imposes compulsory growth, concentrates wealth, creates greed, feeds greed, devalues social capital, and the actual process itself is actually unsustainable. So let's look at the first one. It causes competition. When a bank makes a loan, you go in, you get a loan, it never creates the interest on that loan. So when they're looking at your credit rating, they're assessing how successful you can be competing in your community to bring in the interest over a 20, 30 year period. And by default, people have to go bankrupt because there isn't, the money is not created in sufficiency to cover both the principal and the interest. So basically the interest you're bringing in to the bank is actually somebody else's principal. It also creates short termism. And so what, what does that mean? So if I said to you, everybody leaving today will get a hundred dollars and you say, um, well, I would probably take it now, well, because not because, well, you feel that you never see me again, but say if somebody here in this community said, would you like $100 now or $100 in 10 years' time? What would you do? Tell me, who would take $100 now? And how many people would take $100 in 10 years' time? Okay, and why is that? It's because that $100 is not going to be worth the same amount as it is now. So as a result of that, businesses make short term, um, uh, short, they involved in short term thinking. So and rather than investing in something that will take many, many years to develop, they have to do something that actually creates a profit and the money is maximized. So from your viewpoint, they do, instead of, you know, planting oak trees, they actually plant um, pine trees uh, that will only totally take 10 years to grow because from a financial perspective, it is more profitable to take the short-term route. It, it, it causes compulsory growth. Um, you know, it takes two and a half Earths in order to maintain a, 
a uh, standard of living that we have here in the United States and here in Canada. I talk to any uh, CEO of any corporation, they cannot think more than two quarters into the future. They, and they have to continually grow by a certain margin every single quarter. That is another, uh, another dynamic of interest. It actually causes concentration of wealth because it's not just that because rich people are quote unquote greedy or there's something strange about them. Interest is actually an extraction mechanism. It takes from the poor because those are the people that need to go out and get a loan and it, concentrated, it gets concentrated up in the first 1%. This is just a quick diagram that will actually show you the global distribution of wealth and as you can see the bottom 99.9% .9 where I think we're all at actually contains only 90% of the world's wealth while the top 1.1% 1 .1 uh, actually holds the rest and that is not because of anything other than the functional dynamics of interest. It also raised, it also totally erodes social capitalism and what that is the meshing of societies and in the book there's a great story about this tribe that was uh, living outside what is now South Africa and they for years and years and years and years had no contact with the outside world they didn't know what money was but in their society they actually um, all lived around an open fire with their uh, campsites, with uh, their flap opening out into the central um, nucleus of, of the, where the fire was, where the community was. And they shared everything. If somebody didn't have something, they shared. You know, it was one for all, all for one. They brought in uh, conventional money. And within a matter of five years, that whole community was totally torn apart. And they stopped sharing. Uh, they turned their uh, uh, campsites, their actual tents, around facing the other way so people couldn't see in. So we have story of story of stories of how the current monetary system er totally erodes the social capital in a society. And with all this going on, it is no wonder that people are quote-unquote greedy. Because if I cannot rely on my society, if I cannot rely on my neighborhood, if I have got to cling on to my money in order that I know that I'll be able to take care of myself for my, when I'm in my old age, you do nothing but be greedy and accumulate. It is all part and parcel of the DNA programming of the conventional money system. We have the booms and busts of the uh, business cycle. Every economist takes this as just normal. But again, it's programmed into the money itself. You know, there are valleys and peaks, and there are times when the banks are lending, and there's times when they're not. And when there are times the banks are not lending, a lot of unemployment happens, and that has huge implications for sustainability. So the actual uh, money creation itself causes the booms and busts. And what does that mean when it comes to sustainability? It means that you've got to take everything as not counting, meaning it doesn't matter if you pollute that river because you have got to make a profit at the end of the next quarter. It means that you look at a forest and your timber is worth more as dead timber, as fell timber than a live um, wood. So this is just the, the functionality of interest itself. And that's why we actually, you know, take this beautiful, shimmering, blue-green planet and actually garbage it, rubbish it. And we're doing it more and more over time. What money really is, is an... Sorry, there's a hand. Hi, sorry. So, um, the causing the business cycle, um, the, the play of uh, money creation in that, that's still a symptom of something even deeper, though, is it not? Um, like, sure, yeah. It's, like, so if a bank is not making, a, making loans, then the economy isn't investing or whatever, growing, which is causing the... The further slide, the further yeah. Slide, yeah. yeah. That's still just a symptom of something even deeper, which is like human, it's like our, you know, it's, it's a, social... 
No, what I'm saying, the point I'm trying to make is, it's not just who we are as human beings. We are being programmed, and thank you for the clarification, we are being programmed by our money system to act in antisocial ways, to discount the future, all the various aspects because of the way money is programmed. And it's now possible to program money in a different way where it have different values. And we can go more into it at the question Q&A at the end. Thank you. So what is money? The, um, money is an agreement to use something as a standardized medium of exchange. It is, um, over time, everything from tobacco leaves, stones, axes, all kinds of things have been used as money. And there are different types of agreements and people are thinking outside the box. Now, how many of you actually belong to a local currency system or know about complementary currencies? Okay. How many of you, of you use frequent flyer miles? Okay. Frequent flyer miles is um, a system that was devised by American Airlines about 40 years ago in order to incentivize loyalty. It was a marketing gimmick. gimmick. So as you can see here, this is the normal economy um, moving right along, going down the river, but sticking up are all these unused resources and unmet needs. So complementary currencies or local currencies or cooperative currencies are being designed to link unused resources with unmet needs. So in the commercial application of uh, frequent flyer miles, the airlines looked at customer loyalty as a marketing gimmick and they had all the spare capacity of empty seats. So they arranged another currency which are frequent flyer miles and what is really interesting about frequent flyer miles 40 years later is that they can process huge amount of data enormously cheaply and very, very quickly. And most importantly, they changed passenger behavior. So today there are over, well, that was taken a while ago, but there are about 6,000 social purpose complementary currencies all over the world. <coughs> What their features are is they carry no interest or sometimes have a negative interest rate. They're bottom-up solutions, they're hyper-democratic and have transparent accounting. And I'm going to tell you some examples from, taken from around the world. So, so this is an arboretum in a town called Curitiba, Brazil. And what is very interesting about this parkland, this very, very beautiful um, park, is it once stood on that particular garbage dump. And the mayor of Curitiba at the time was beside himself. This is about 25 years ago. A number of people, there's been a huge influx of people into Curitiba in order to get work. And a number of favelas, shanty towns, grew up. And he had a garbage problem. He didn't have the money to go into the favelas and collect the garbage. So he realized that he did have spare capacity, rather like the airlines, on his bus service. Now this is the bus service today, but I'll give you an idea. Um, everybody pays a token into, the, into that waiting area. When the bus comes up, about several doors open up and they all climb on the bus and about 50 people can get in there in a matter of under a minute. It's very, very efficient and works extremely well. Here they are getting off the bus here. So, what he decided to do was to send out an announcement to the favelas and said, for everybody who comes in with a bag of garbage that has been sorted out between glass and paper and um, tin, for example, and they're put into different colored vats that, that are around the circumference of the favelas, they will get a token to ride on the bus system. Lo and behold, in a matter of two weeks, the favelas were picked absolutely clean and uh, they used the bus tokens to use the bus service with the spare capacity on the bus service. And later on, local farmers and local providers started accepting these tokens uh, in exchange for um, you know, locally grown vegetables and fruits. And if you can see on the box there, in Portuguese, what they have written is garbage that is not garbage. So garbage literally became a money system. 
And this is my favorite uh, picture of all that, that uh, Jaime gave me, which is uh, on days that the fishermen go out into the bay and the fish are not biting, they actually trawl for garbage. So that is garbage that will be brought in and they will get tokens for that garbage. They will, and, and then the garbage is then recycled. So uh, this is one of 13 parks in Curitiba, Brazil, that have been built by using a number of different types of complementary currencies. Of course, there was the garbage one. There was another brilliant one uh, that, came, that was introduced for big multinationals that wanted to build skyscrapers in, Cur in Curitiba and part of the currency they had to, it's become, I'm not going to get into explain it, but the upshot was the currency, the complementary currency that was generated by, uh, if they wanted to build over a certain height, they had to do X meters of public space and pu public grounds. So this is actually built on a complementary currency. And what is also very interesting is that these are not just cute little uh, ideas. As a result of several of these complementary currencies that were utilized in Curitiba, the average person in Curitiba, after about five years, had a standard of living that was one third higher than anybody else living anywhere else in, in Brazil. So it really reflected in people's pocketbooks, as well as having a standard of living and living in a very, very beautiful city. And that city won the UN prize for the most ecologically advanced city in the entire world, not just as a, as a developing country, but in the entire world. What does a high standard of living mean? Pardon me? What does a high standard of living mean? That means they had a higher standard of living than the average other person living in Brazil by one third. So, like, they lived in a more beautiful place? Like then not only did they live. Yeah, they had not only a more aesthetically beautiful place, they cleaned up the garbage, they had a very efficient uh, bus service, but also they had more money in their pockets because they were able to use other currencies, they became wealthier as a result. Yes, the people in the Curitiba. And the bus service was so wonderful that even the very wealthy used it. You know, they, just, they made a change, uh, you know, to leave their car at home and use the bus service because of... Pardon me? Um, it's a more egalitarian society, if that's your point. Yes, absolutely, like Canada. <laughs> um, this is an, another um, uh, currency that's actually worked, working in the town of Ghent in Flanders, Belgium. And they have a huge economic problem because, again, they have a, a number of um, immigrants that have come in from all over Europe. Uh, there's about 20 languages being spoken in this particular um, uh, neighborhood of Ghent. And they sent out, they felt, these immigrants felt very, very marginalized and not part of the greater society and the greater uh, marvelous town of, and city of Ghent. So they sent, the municipality sent out a question air to all these immigrants and said, what would you like? And said, we would really love to have a garden. You know, we come from the countryside, we'd love to be able to grow some of our own fruit and vegetables. I'd like to spend time with my children and teach them some gardening skills. So the starting point was a little garden. So here is, these are not actors, ladies and gentlemen, these are real people. This was the uh, space of an old factory which was leveled. You can still see the uh, ground uh, that was actually the uh, factory floor. And there are little gardens by two to three, four meters square. The interesting thing about this project is you, you can only rent this ground. And furthermore, you cannot rent them in euros. You can only rent them in the local currency of the town, which is called a turka, which means a tower. And you can see in some of the social housing, you know, this is not a very, very lovely part of town at all. But for, they made a list of all the things you can do in order to uh, earn these turkas. You can do things like uh, beautify, uh, clean up the town, for example. You can put pots of flowers outside uh, your window, windowsill. Uh, you can, um, you know, there's a whole list of, of activities that the town wants the people to do in order to have a more beautiful neighborhood. Here you see them actually growing uh, flowers. For the first time, 
uh, with, this, with this particular program, the town of Ghent had more volunteers they could possibly use. And with their small budget, they were able to leverage it in the first year three times over. And they expect this year, which is the third year of this program, to leverage it 20 times over by using this complementary currency called Turkas. Um, another um, complementary currency I just want to touch on very, very briefly is called Furi Aikipu, which literally means carrying friendship tickets. And one of the, the countries that hit the problem straight on of how to deal with the grain population was Japan. And what they did was, um, again, again, an issue of, of, you know, how do we find the money to take care of our elderly in their golden age, is I earn a furio kipu by going down the street and calling in my local neighbor, and I might take her out for a drive to go see her uh, dentist, I might help her with a letter, uh, I might help her with her shopping. And for every hour that I help her out, that is everything that the medical uh, insurance system does not cover, I get a electronic credit in my Furi Aikipu account, which I can save and uh, use when, say, I've got the flu, I need somebody to look after my kids. Or more interesting still, I can actually transfer these Furi Aikipu to another part of Japan and somebody can come in and look after my mum. What's really interesting about this is the elderly absolutely delighted with this system. Because number one, they can stay in their own homes with greater dignity. Also, there are relationships that are building up within the community. You know, in an age where we are very much siloed, given our generational, um, wherever, we, where, wherever where we find ourselves on the generational continuum, is young people are spending time with older people and real relationships are, are, are growing and building and the elderly love it because a lot of things that they complain about is that they feel lonely and it's great to see the smiling face on their doorstep to give them a hand with what they're doing. And again, taking care of this elderly, they're able to stay in their own homes for longer, that means they don't, don't have to be institutionalized and it's not costing the government, the local government, anything. So there are almost 500 of these systems operational all through Japan with two central electronic clearing houses just to make sure the system is running fluidly. Um, it's kind of similar to time banking. Uh, time banking was created uh, back in the 80s by Dr. Edgar Kahn and basically for an hour of service you get a time dollar. And these are used in so many applications around the United States. There's about 400 such systems in the United States. I know there are some here in, the, in, in Canada. And they're growing by one to two systems every single week. And they do everything from mentoring children, um, prisoners returning home that they can actually get work by in the time banking system. Uh, in New York, uh, it's used a lot for immigrants coming in and teaching them English. And what they're finding is not only are they getting services, but again, it's knitting the society together, this social capital we talked about before. Um, this is the, one of the largest systems in the United States. It's called the Visiting Nurses Service, something akin to Furia Kipu. And this has been blessed by Mayor Bloomberg and its operation in the five boroughs of, of, of the uh, greater New York area. Um, very quickly, I'm gonna ask a question. Um, why do you think Switzerland is so economically stable? Any ideas? Anybody? Yes, over there. Swiss, and they, they don't have resources. They don't have resources? They don't have any natural resources, practically zero. Okay, but what they makes have, them... They have to become inventive. They have to become inventive, so they're inventive, okay. Hi. There are major centers for tax havens where rich people don't have to pay the tax. So it's a tax haven. Any other reason why it's so economically stable, do you think? Any ideas? Is it the glacial water? The great chocolate that they have? Yes, this gentleman with the blue. It's just a guess, but I'm guessing no foreign ownership. <laughs> Interesting. The, yeah, and this gentleman here, please. Why do you think the Swiss has such a um, uh, robust uh, economy? Well, a bit, because you were speaking of how the system is actually creating people to work with money in a certain way, and that's reflected 
in global governance, and I'm thinking of the International Bank of Settlements is, is headquartered in Switzerland, and that's sort of a central bank of central banks. Yes. So. You're, you're correct in the fact that the BIS is actually in, in Switzerland, but that's not the reason why. The reason why... Uh, sorry, one more. Yes? Okay, that they were neutral. Okay, it was actually none of these at all. The reason why the Swiss are so economically stable is because they have a B2B, a business-to-business -business complementary currency. So if you can imagine, 80 years ago, almost to the day, 17 businessmen got letters from their local bank saying that their line of credit was either going to be cut completely or dramatically reduced. So they're all sitting around with their heads in their hands, what are we going to do? And they realized that they were actually borrowing money from the local bank in order to pay the invoices of one another. So they decided to set up their own complementary currency, their own currency, which is called the WIR, W-I-R, which means we ourselves. And basically it's a mutual credit situation. So I sell you something, I get a credit, you get a debit. It's basically let's. And for all you great Canadians that know about let's, and yeah, it's basically a mutual credit situation uh, system based on let's, which is debits and credits. So how does this differ from barter? Barter is when I come over to cut your grass for a dozen eggs, but say if you hate my gardening skills, and trust me, you will, I'm, I need to take some lessons here, um, you know, we can't do a trade. But that's why we need money in order to facilitate exchanges. So here, rather than doing a barter situation between all the different businesses in the weir, they actually used a currency because I may want to buy from you, but I may not be able to sell and get and receive uh, an equal uh, product or service. So we need a currency. So 80 years later, ladies and gentlemen, there are now 70,000 businesses in this cooperative. And it is a cooperative. They have their bank. And it is responsible for 16% of, of all businesses trading. So when the banks are not lending, they all go to the Weir Bank and they uh, go about their business and are able to pay their invoices and their um, employees. This is um, another example in Lithuania. The, um, and it, I think it's really uh, poignant because the new prime minister of Dora, who is a woman, uh, decided that she really wanted to make her country of Lithuania a learning country. She wanted all Lithuanians under the age of 40 to speak at least three languages, obviously Lithuanian, but they want, to want them to speak Chinese, English, Spanish, some major um, languages, to be proficient in the use of the internet and to encourage this intergenerational learning. So very briefly, um, what you should know about Lithuania is that it has the highest pen penetration of, of fiber optic broadband in Europe, and everybody has a cell phone and a SIM card. So how it works out is that everybody has their bucket list. Everybody has a dream. And it may be, oh, I want to go live with the Maasai warriors in Kenya for a while. Maybe I want to come to Victoria and um, let me see, uh, study oceanography, for example. Whatever the dream that the average citizen in Lithuania has, they go to, they have a dream project, and they make a deal with the Lithuanian Learning Foundation. And they say, I will teach English for 300 hours if I can get my dream, which is to go and study Buddhism in um, Sri Lanka, for example. So they make the contract, and the person uh, is paid in doras, which is the complementary currency. Uh, the dora account is their mobile phone number. And interestingly, a nonprofit uh, runs the entire system. And what is really interesting in this cooperative, in this complementary currency universe, the nonprofits pay the play the type of role that corporations pay play in the conventional, com highly competitive economy. So also uh, nonprofits have learning uh, quotients to what they're doing. It may be permaculture, for example, and uh, there can be teaching and learning of, of uh, permacultural techniques. So anyway, 
uh, the person goes out, fulfills their, fulfills their uh, contract, and the Lithuanian F Learning Foundation puts the whole package together between frequent flyer miles and who's going to sponsor it and uh, who's going to look after the person. The whole package is put together by the Lithuanian um, uh, Learning Foundation. What is interesting in how they earn the Doras is one other way is through internet proficiency. And here we have a situation of a young person, usually over the age of 12, teaching somebody of an older generation how to use Facebook. <laughs> and what is lovely about this is that both the person who's learning and the person who's giving the lesson earn Doras. And again, we see another meshing of the inter intergenerational uh, connectivity. And it's fostering this whole goal of the country for lifelong learning. And I think my favorite one here is um, the National Wisdom Council, where children under the age of 12 are invited to go into their community and find somebody much older in their community and ask them this very, very provocative question. What is it in your life that you have learned that would be of benefit for me to know now? And as you can imagine, this very engaged conversation uh, develops and the child can write an essay, they can make a video of it, they can do an interpretive dance of it, whatever it is, and there's a national competition. Again, prizes given in Doras for this. So there are so many new monetary solutions. Uh, there's a, pro a project called the Terra, which is a global currency for corporations that has a negative interest rate, so therefore they're not discounting the future. Um, there's solutions for housing and how people can actually get affordable account, uh, housing and actually can get uh, a friendly mortgage that doesn't have interest. And that's the, uh, the Yak Bank of Sweden. Um, there are all kinds of designs to support local business, to get people to shop locally, for example, such as the Berkshires and the Berkshires of the USA. Uh, there's a regional currency. A network is about uh, 64 uh, regional currencies in Germany and Austria called the Regio and again they're very very much uh, focused on getting people to support the local uh, economy. Banco Palmas which is one of the most absolutely inspiring story of how um, uh, they came up with the idea again of asking this question these two communities were ripped from their um, uh, shore uh, they were living on the banks of this very famous place called Fortaleza in Brazil and they were actually moved out because these uh, big developers wanted to come in and build luxury hotels so these two communities were just uprooted overnight and plonked down in the middle of absolutely nowhere swampland and they all got together in a very makeshift hall and they asked the question, why are we poor? And you know, they're all sort of shaking their heads and scratching their heads and not knowing what the answer was. So they made an agreement to come back the week later and work out how much money they had. And they, in that small community, and we're talking about something enormously makeshift, the roads were hardly in, there was hardly any lighting. I mean, there was devastatingly nothing. They realized that they had between them all about $625,000. And they said, okay, it's not great money, but it's money, and what's happening? And they said, well, the reason why we are poor is because our money leaves our community. So there, lo and behold, they created a local currency called Palmas, meaning palm trees. And in a matter of under a year, they created 3,000 jobs locally, where there was not a job. And, um, and they really got their economy rolling. And it was very, very interesting because the uh, Central Bank of Brazil looked up and said, this is not good. And they um, put a lawsuit, they uh, filed a lawsuit against the founder of Palmas, a guy called Joaquin de Melo Segundo. And um, it went all the way up to the high court. And so as you can imagine the tense scene, there is the Central Bank of Brazil sitting there and this poor ex-priest ex sitting there in the other corner and the judge is sitting there and uh, he turns to the central bank and says, um, okay, uh, what have you done for the poor? There was absolute dead silence and the lawsuit was turned in favor of Banco Palmas 
And now Brazil, the government of Brazil, they've done a lot of surveys, they realize that complementary currencies, local currencies, do not mitigate, do not hurt the conventional system, but working in tandem, they do incredible things for local economies and for the economy as a whole. They have gotten behind a series of dual banks system where there's uh, regular conventional money and there is local currencies. There are now 103 and they have a plan to produce um, another, well, 200 um, uh, over the next year or two. So again, ordinary people are doing extraordinary things by assessing what are their unused resources and what their unmet needs are. And what are young news resources? It's empty chairs um, you know, in a restaurant, empty seats in a cinema, in your theatres, uh, you know, uh, chapels like this that are not being used. There are so many unused resources, not even to begin to untap those that are unemployed or underemployed. And the list of our desires, our needs are as long as your arm. So a community can come together and, and design a currency that link these unused resources with an unmet need. Um, I don't know how we're, doing, how we're doing for time here. I think we're, I need to wind, wind, wind up here. But there is, this is not just um, pie in the sky. There really is some very deep science behind looking at the issue of sustainability and the fact that our monetary system is unsustainable. And very wonderful people have been looking at ecosystems and they have found that they can find a single metric that shows the optimal place where a biosystem functions. And it's a, it's a balance between efficiency and resilience. And just very, very, you know, it's not just a case there isn't enough money, you know, there is something very, very important in complex flow networks. And a complex flow network is biomass in an ecosystem, electrons in electric circuit, information in the immune system, and of course, money in an economy. And they're all the same. Um, it's a balance between efficiency and resilience. And resilience comprises of two uh, factors, which is diversity, obviously choice, and interconnectivity. So in a high diversity would be the uh, Amazon here, it's lush, all kinds of uh, vegetation. And here is a squirrel in Central Park that can eat anything. So, you know, it has a lot of diversity and interconnectivity. Here is a low diversity, a monoculture. This is a monoculture of pines. It's highly efficient, but if there's a blight or, or some kind of disease, um, you know, that forest is wiped out. And here, you know, in the animal kingdom, it will be a, uh, a panda, very cute, very lovely, but it only eats one type of, of uh, bamboo. So, running very quickly through it, um, they have found there is something called a window of viability. Where, what, no matter what natural ecosystem you're looking at, whether it's a pool of water outside here, whether you go up to the frozen tundra up here, uh, north of, in this province, uh, the Amazon, there, no matter what, they have looked at all types of ecosystems and there is this window of vitality. And our economic system is not uh, resilient. Uh, according to the IMF itself, there have been 145 banking crashes, 208 monetary cash crashes, and 72 sovereign debt crises. So a banking crisis is what happened in the United States in 2007, 2008. Monetary crashes is when the ruble you know, fell apart, the uh, Argentine peso fell apart, and sovereign debt is something what uh, Greece is going through at the moment. So, but it's not just because the people are crazy, it's those crazy Greeks or those dreadful Irish people, you know, that can't manage their money. It is actually something systemic in the monetary system itself. And um, so um, our monetary system is highly efficient. It's highly efficient because it's only one type of money, whether it's a Canadian dollar, a euro, a yen, a peso, it's still the same type of money. It is bank debt money. All the same type. So it's highly efficient. You can process billions and billions and billions and billions of units of account in a matter of seconds. Um, brilliant at doing that, but it is brittle in the sense there is no diversity in our system. So what we're saying here is in natural ecosystems, resilience 
is much larger than efficiency and in our monetary system or our uh, uh, system that's out of whack efficiency totally overshadows resilience and resilience is comprising of interconnectivity and diversity so um, literally when there's a crash there's too little diversity you know um, you know natural systems uh, come up with lots of different new plants, new systems, and can bring itself back up to a window of vitality. In our monetary system, we keep on repeating the same, 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 this da disaster, there may be a little few barter exchanges so people can survive, but they go back to the reestablishment of the monetary uh, monoculture again and again and again. So, ladies and gentlemen, our international monetary system is in trouble. You know, whether it's top down, whether you're bottom up, whether you're right or left, whatever perspective you want to use, there is nothing but trouble. Uh, this may not be aesthetically very pleasing, but it basically, what is interesting is The Economist um, came up with that um, depiction of what our system is. And we're running out of solutions. I mean, um, they keep on talking about um, same, same, you know, I think if you look at what they were saying in the 1930s and what they're saying now, there are no really new bright ideas. And I think what is interesting about us now is that we are coming to, here we are uh, almost on 2020, and we have several ages that are, are crash landing. We're having the end of the patriarchal system, hyper-rationalism, modernism, the Industrial Revolution, and the Cold War. They're all ending. And our current monetary system was created way back here in the 1700s in Sweden. And it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant, uh, in the way it egged on and helped the Industrial Revolution take, uh, take place. Because for the first time, you could make money out of money. And it was then possible to bankroll very large projects like you know, railroads, factories, you name it. However, um, we now are in an information age and hopefully moving to a wisdom age. So we need new types of money to reflect the gestalt, the zeitgeist of our age. So remember, it's not just the amount of money that's been used. We all think, well, gee whiz, if we just throw money at a problem, that it will get resolved. In fact, it is the type of money, whether the money is a complementary currency, how it is structured, does it have an interest rate, no interest rate, a negative interest rate, you know, how is it created, what's backing it. You know, complementary currencies can be backed by time. It can be uh, backed by goods and services. These types of money are the crutches, I will think, that will get us to an age when perhaps we don't even need money because everybody's needs will be taken care of, but that's way, way in the future. And I think it is very poignant for us to actually consider money when we're thinking about how we are going to take care of this beautiful, fragile planet hurling in space. And until and unless we think, rethink money, I don't believe it's going to be possible but I'm enormously buoyed by the uh, incredible inventiveness of communities all around the world that have come together and have rethought money by linking their unused resources and their unmet needs.